Thank you, John. And indeed, welcome to MIT Media Lab. I'm a faculty here uh, at the Media Lab, right on the second floor, and I co-direct a, a director group called Camera Culture. So today I'm going to talk about how can we augment surgeons uh, to go from a patient scale to population scale using AR, AI, and sensors. But before we talk about surgery going population scale, um, just imagine our driving going from an individual driver scale to population scale. How did we do that? Anybody uses this app? Yeah, Waze, right? It has allowed us to realize that instead of continuing on 295, we might want to take a streamland and go around it. Um, and if you have a complication that's coming up, we have a guidance to see what kind of hazard uh, may be along the way. And this is possible not because we have somehow augmented the car, but because we have augmented how we work with the population. <clears throat> so how can we create these ways for surgeons? Uh, how can we create tools so that they can realize going at 295 right now is not a good way, although that's what they do on a daily basis, but maybe it's time to go and take the Streamland detour. And to do that, for any AI task for out there, we have three things we must do. We have to capture, we have to analyze, and we have to interact, right? Any AI system. So in this case, we have to figure out, just like Waze, how can we get real-time data or data from historic use from millions of such users, in this case, millions of surgery videos. How can we analyze uh, all that data, uh, to especially look for anomalies, complications, comorbidities, uh, and then how do you also interact in real time uh, with such a solution? So, uh, you know, as John mentioned, my PhD thesis about almost 20 years ago now, you know, I was very obsessed just like many of us in this room, on kind of creating this X-ray vision for a lot of tasks to make the invisible visible in real time, uh, either by using HMDs uh, or this whole new method of using projectors, you know, spatial augmented reality. Um, <clears throat> and then if you think about the pipeline for augmented reality, uh, which is also the motto of my group at Camera Culture, is how can we sense beyond human ability abstract and synthesize so that what we present is well within, compress, uh, well within human comprehensibility. That's what we really do in AR. But what I'm realizing is actually this is a very incomplete way of thinking about AR. And even within that older definition, we are very obsessed right now with the display aspect of it. The resolution, field of view, and what we are trying to do is um, realizing that with physics, we simply cannot beat what the human perception needs. Uh, and so we're finding the dips in human perception so that the physics can just come in at the right time, at the right scale, and then we can create believable insertions of digital information uh, in the physical world. But again, I think we are just looking at a very narrow aspect of what AR can do for us. And to me, uh, in the late 90s, um, you know, I was so obsessed about getting the lighting right, the shadow right, the occlusions and refraction and so on. Um, and you know, the whole reason I got into this field was Jurassic Park, 1993. Um, and then later on, I saw South Park, and that completely changed my world. I would say it actually knocked me out, out of the field of AR and VR. Because South Park, no shadows, no refractions, no notion of Euclidean geometry, and still is as entertaining, maybe even more entertaining, than something that requires all this extra work. So do we want to live in the South Park world, or we want to live in the Jurassic Park world? That's what I, I, I came out to. And uh, Jim Favorda at Cornell has actually described this a long time ago, which is when we think about you know, living in the real world and using digital information, that realism, it's not just photorealism or physical realism, but we also have a notion of non-visual realism. Sometimes you can just hear a story just with text and words, and that creates realism, or sometimes just functional realism. 
like South Park. So where should we be along this axis? Because going to the right is extremely expensive and also creates this you know, uncanny valley problem. Now, if we kind of find the right spot for AR, somewhere between functional realism, which is South Park, and photorealism, which is Jurassic Park, I think we are very far behind. We need to have research and startups and innovation in so many other areas that we're simply not going after. You know, the neuroscience um, uh, literature I have looked at uh, is still not catching up uh, when it comes to functional realism. <clears throat> A lot of understanding of our perception uh, is incomplete. Uh, there are very, very few data sets. If you look at rest of the fields that are making progress uh, using computer vision or machine learning, we just don't have the data sets uh, to make this progress. So coming back to surgery then, we quickly realize it's not about creating the most amazing headset so that the surgeons can use it, but it's everything else that's going on in this very multi-format, multi-mode world where the perception and the team management and sensors and hygiene and the gestures are all part of this very intense uh, few minutes or few hours that are in the operating room. So we need to kind of start adding things uh, that I have put in yellow here, you know, training data sets, thinking about perception, and, and, and all those things, right? Um, and a lot of my thesis work uh, about 20 years ago was realizing this multi-mode AR is critical, which is if you want to insert a digital information on a real object, you know, you can create something, you know, in the eye or near the eye, but can all be at arm's length and could be on the object itself. So you can think about retinal, head-mounted, handheld, and also the spatial see-through displays, but eventually you could just use a projector. And that's what I was kind of obsessed with, with this notion of spatial augmented reality um, uh, or in shader lamps, which is lamps that can provide information for reflectance, illumination, motion, and interaction. So this was all good uh, about 20 years ago, but I have interacted with my colleagues uh, in the clinical, medical, and surgical fields, uh, I think a lot of these assumptions are now coming down. So when we talk about taking from patient scale to population scale, uh, we have to realize that, you know, machines are not going to replace the talented hands of surgeons anytime soon. <clears throat> That's where augmentation comes in. At the same time, we have a worldwide scarcity of surgeons. Uh, so how are we going to create a solution that allows them to amplify, augment, and project uh, over scale, over, over space and time. So two main ideas, augmenting surgeons with ways and using the notion of precision health and population health for surgery using a concept called anatom, which is omics for anatomy. So ways for surgeons, what would it look like? Uh, in the simplest scenario, you know, you have something that you're all familiar with. You know, it gives you some decision-making uh, abilities. You can share tips. It can be great for training. It can be good for finding anomalies right when you're looking at something. You know, should you cut the red wire or the green wire, as we would see in Hollywood movies? Uh, and then we have to solve these issues of UX of how would you demonstrate, you know, the detour from 295? Um, and the potential complications or comorbidity challenges, right? Kind of a very open area. I don't have solutions for this. But if you step back and look at the surgical theater, uh, you know, there are many multimodal aspects of this problem that we need to solve. First of all, we need to get rid of, you know, a lot of the things you would see in a surgical room, like, a, you know, um, you know um, a, a strong lamps, you know, all the various tools that are out there, because all these things can be moved back into the ceiling with you know, an array of cameras, an array of projectors, and tracking solutions, as you would see. Um, and of course, you would still keep it multimodal. You would still have other, digital, other ways to provide digital information. And uh, the assistant that's shown here um, you know, in, in, in purple can also be virtual uh, for, for telesurgeries and so on. So there are many aspects of this. And when it comes to capture, you know, in simple words, we would say, it's just surgery videos, millions of surgery videos, say, of, of gallbladder. But in reality, what we also need to capture 
is what's, what the surgeon's doing, what their interactions were, what, what their perception level was, the attention level. And what we have to realize today is a headset, an AR or a VR headset, is not just a display device, but it's actually also a sensing device, right? And one could argue that companies like Google or Facebook are making billions of dollars, not because browser is a display, but because browser is an input device for them. And it's the same thing with AR. I think the real value is going to be unlocked when we realize that AR is actually a sensing device, not just a display device. And that's what's going to help us understand what a surgeon or a nurse or an assistant is doing uh, in, in a surgical theater. So, so it's not just video. You have audio, you have interaction, you have haptics, you have gaze, you have uh, you know, um, uh, emotional state um, and interactions. When it comes to analyze, um, of course we can use computer vision, machine learning, uh, and NLP, but we also analyze with respect to what's possible. You know, what are some tips they have shared and what are some anomalies that you know, surgical experts really care about? And then finally, when it comes to interaction, it's not just a, a, a ways like a video overlay of the red wire or the green wire, uh, but then you have so many other ways to nudge and guide. And that would involve you know, haptics and audio and other interactions as well. So we have a, you know, a collection of solutions that need to seamlessly work together to really create the ways for surgeons. So we have capture, analyze, and act. And you know, any solution that you see in the world goes through three phases. We have to improve it, we have to transform, and we have to disrupt. But in the short term, just to improve, as we talked about, sharing tips and tricks, you know, avoid the waiting of uh, managing the teams, you know, um, rapidly training and education, really creating Olympians out of you know, new surgeons. As we start thinking about transforming uh, precision and population health, Population health is a way to capture information from uh, many medical uh, activities, me medical uh, touch points, and precision health is about really um, kind of narrowing it down for an individual as you would be uh, in that surgery room. Um, in real time, can we do post-operative predictions? So what could be the complications after the patient actually leaves uh, you know, the hospital? <clears throat> When it comes to anatome, uh, you may be familiar with other types of omics uh, that allows us to do these population-wide studies. Uh, when it comes to anatome, um, and this is the idea that Lee Sanders at Stanford and myself have been exploring um, for machine learning, is this notion that the structure, the function, development, evolution, and the network, which is relationship with other anatomical parts, is what's really going to drive. Um, and one could argue that majority of complications that take place uh, in surgical settings are because of a surprise in the anatome of a patient. Um, like some of us have heart on the other side of our body. Did you know that? Um, and if you have an anatome, you know, it allows the surgeons to plan for it way in advance. And of course, to capture the anatome, you would still have radiomics using radiology and all the other layers we're talking about. But while most of the uh, um, omics are focused on the cellular or molecular level, uh, anatomes would be at mesoscopic levels, at millimeter and even centimeter scale. So if we have the ways plus anatom, we can really start thinking about disrupting how we would augment surgery. So on the capture side, of course, we would have cellular and molecular and multispectral level of capturing this information. But then if we have this anatomical structure library uh, in real time by looking at the surgery in, in, in progress, the computer vision analysis on your headset or the other modality that you have in the ceiling would give you a approximation of an anatomy, the signature of the anatomy that you can look up in those millions of videos that we talked about and start creating predictions of where you are. This would be very much like a GPS coordinate and the current state and current direction in Waze. That's what allows Waze to go and start figuring out how it should suggest the paths that you're going to take and should take. 
Uh, and finally, we can really start providing guided options um, like we would do in precision health uh, or precision medicine. Um, and I would say the real disruption would be you know, a moderately trained surgeon can start performing more complex surgeries uh, without special training. And over time, also perform telesurgeries, even if they are not familiar with uh, you know, a particular patient and all the records, but the real-time information, just like you would drive on ways on streets that you have never driven on before. So there are many challenges to achieve this augmentation for surgeons. How would you even get millions of surgery videos, and how would you get label them in a meaningful way, and how would you analyze uh, to create the anatome, and how would you deal with the bias uh, and this rare complications, which is what you really care about. The viewpoint from which you would observe a surgery might be different from the viewpoint from which you might have recorded the other millions of videos. So a lot of challenges with uh, viewpoints, but that's what we are familiar with in the VR and AR world. And when it comes to interaction, Maybe South Park is the right way to go, but if you have a cartoonish VR or AR, even the UX uh, might get in the way. So there are fantastic open problems uh, that we are thinking about uh, at our group here at MIT. So before I conclude, I want to thank you know, my camera culture group here, um, and, uh, but also want to thank some of the surgeons like uh, Dr. Lee Sanders, Dr. Carla Pugh, Dr. Raj Gupta and Dr. Daniel Kraft who are really challenging me how surger surgery can interface with AI uh, and AR. Who has seen this movie? Which one? Prometheus. So Daniel Kraft uh, told me to look at Prometheus as an example. And when we think about the future of surgery, that's what we look at, you know, uh, roboticized, extremely um, uh, mechanized, uh, with lots of sensors, uh, but it is debatable if this is how we're going to go because I don't see how we're going to replace surgeons for the foreseeable future because of their dexterity, their knowledge, and their ability to make decisions, very critical decisions uh, on the spot. So as John said, I think ARIA really stands for AR for intelligence amplification because I think intelligence amplification can really beat AI. Uh, with AR, and we have an ability with ARIA to go from a patient scale uh, surgical mindset to a population scale surgical mindset. And if we have ways for surgeons and anatome, we can create novel surgeries without special training. Thank you.